Welcome to the first module of the short course on generating spatially variant lattices. This module will not teach anything. It's just a motivational module where I want to describe what is a spatially variant lattice and why do we care. The course has two parts. There are the theory modules and there are the computer sessions and they're a little bit interlaced. The four theory sessions, if you will, teach the algorithm, but we talk, uh, we, we talk a little about implementation, but things won't be completely clear until the computer sessions. And in the computer sessions, we pop open MATLAB and we type every single line of code and sometimes refer back to the theory slides and we get them all connected. The four theory modules, the first one is the introduction. We're in the middle of that and that's motivational. What is a spatially variant lattice and why is it good? Modules two and three teach the algorithm that we use to generate spatially variant lattices. The, we've divided this into two different parts. The second module will teach how to spatially vary a planar grading. That is a straight line. And you want to understand this very well. You want to be a numerical ninja for spatially variant planar gradings. Then we move into module three where we talk about spatially varying lattices. And what we'll do, we'll take the desired unit cell for the lattice, we will expand it using a Fourier transform into a set of planar gradings. We'll spatially vary each of those planar gradings individually and then add up all of those spatially variant planar gradings and that overall sum will be the spatially variant lattice. Then the last module, we need to talk about how to get that out of MATLAB and into some kind of CAD package so that then we can look at it, manipulate it more, 3D print it, or do whatever. So on to describing what is a spatially variant lattice. Right now in electromagnetics, metamaterials, metasurfaces, photonic crystals, all of these periodic structures, they're a very big deal right now. And it turns out the periodic structure interacts with the electromagnetic field to produce some pretty amazing properties. And negative refractive index has been demonstrated. Super prisms using really strong dispersion have been demonstrated. Self collimation effect, cloaking, invisibility, all these wonderful things have, are enabled by periodic structures like metamaterials and photonic crystals. And we view these very much as effective materials where we sort of squint our eyes and the periodic structure within these devices sort of blurs and we're left with a macroscopically homogeneous medium with amazing properties. What I want to point out is that we cannot control electromagnetic fields with just homogeneous materials. There has to be some kind of gradient, some kind of surface, some kind of interface, some kind of inhomogeneity if we're going to control the field. So the question I'll ask, why is it almost all of the metamaterials and photonic crystals discussed in the literature are macroscopically homogeneous? Imagine what is, remains locked inside these lattices, the power that we could unlock if we could somehow make them inhomogeneous. Well, there's very good reasons that this has been limited to date. We don't know how to make them inhomogeneous without also destroying their properties. And that's where this spatially variant tool comes in. We can functionally grade, spatially vary, essentially any attribute of a periodic structure without destroying its properties. And what you'll see as we discuss the applications is that we're unlocking amazing performance that we just could not harness before because we could not bend and twist these lattices without destroying the property. So it's very neat. I think this will be an exploding field and let's just dive right into it. 
So here's my cartoon for a periodic structure that does something magical. Now imagine I want to grab it at the left side with my left hand. I'll grab it at the right side with my right hand. And then I want to bend it in the plane of the screen like an accordion so that it would form a 90 degree bend. So what could that look like using conventional coordinate mapping type of techniques? Well, maybe it looks like this. Now, this won't work because notice at the inside of the bend, the unit cells have been compressed and stretched out to be rectangles. The outside of the bend, they're very expanded. So we have not preserved the size and shape of the squares. We designed that lattice to give us these magical properties with those squares being square and with them being the size that they are. So here we tried to bend a lattice, but we can't bend it without changing the size or shape of the squares. And so this is just a taste of the reasons why we can't make lattices inhomogeneous without destroying their electromagnetic properties. So if we use the same task and apply our algorithm, here's the lattice that we get. Notice it is definitely bent 90 degrees and the size and the shape of the squares are almost constant. They're not perfect, and we'll get into that and how to handle that later. But what we've, we've seen so far is lattices like this are close enough that it works electromagnetically without having to do anything else. And there are lots of other things we could do to improve performance even from here. There's ways we can make the lattice look better, and there's ways we can spatially vary other things in a lattice to compensate for something that we can't get quite perfect. So this is what we would call a spatially variant lattice. And we are able to spatially vary or functionally grade pretty much any geometric property of a periodic structure over a very short time scale. And the lattice is still smooth, continuous, defect free. And we've minimized deformations to any geometric parameter that we don't want to spatially vary. So here we've only spatially varied the orientation to give us a 90 degree bend and we've held the size and shape of the square is almost perfect. That's very enabling. Okay, now we know what a spatially variant lattice is. Let's go through some areas where this has been applied. This is some of my very early work when I was at the University of Central Florida working under Dr. Eric Johnson who was the head of the microphotonics lab. And by the way, that lab is now at Clemson University doing equally amazing stuff. But we were looking at form by refringent gratings for converting polarization of beams. The application here was we wanted to excite a hollow core metal waveguide with an optical beam, but it turns out that was very lossy. And so the idea was to produce a beam where the polarization was not linear, it was had an azimuthally polarized beam, sort of what's shown at the bottom here. That's an azimuthally polarized beam. And if we inject that into a hollow core metal waveguide, the electric field will be tangential to all the interfaces. The boundary conditions lets the field go to zero, and we get a very low loss mode. But notice the grading. We want it to spatially vary the orientation of the grading but not change the duty cycle or the height or other things. And so that's the type of grading that came out of this. In other very early work that I did a long time ago, we took a guided mode resonance filter and we designed it to be flat and we measured the transmission. Sorry about the little bit of ugly data. We had some troubles calibrating our chamber, but we see a dip in transmission and this is due to the resonance of the guided mode resonator. Here's the actual device that we tested, and that's somewhere around four feet wide. And down here is a cartoon picture of, of what the device, we had many more periods here, but that just gives you an idea of what it looked like. So a guided mode resonance filter, as it turns out, is very sensitive to angle of incidence. 
So if we were to take that structure, which is flat, and wrap it around a bend, the resonance would disappear. The few spikes that we see are just due to calibration. There's actually no resonance here. And we can understand that because if we have a wave coming into the device straight, it's normally incident here. So this one tooth of the grating would work, but effectively the angle of incidence changes as we move outward. And so the entire rest of the surface would not contribute to a resonance. And so the response disappears. Well, what we can do to compensate for this is to adjust the period of that grating over the curve so that we keep it resonant at the same frequency the entire time. So here's a picture of the device and here's a photograph of the actual one and it turns out we got a very strong resonance when we did that. In fact it was stronger than even the flat design and the reason it was stronger than the flat design because while we're at it we not only compensated for the curvature of the device, but we compensated for the curvature of the source. We were measuring this inside of an anechoic chamber. There was somewhere around 25 feet between the transmitting horn and this device. And so the, the wavefront was not perfectly plane wave. So we compensated for both at the same time and got amazing performance. In more recent work, we looked at a phenomenon of photonic crystals called self-collimation. And what self-collimation is, essentially no matter what direction a wave tries to go through a lattice, it's forced to go in a single direction. And in fact, it's forced to follow the axis of the lattice. So if now we have a, a way of spatially varying the orientation of the unit cells, perhaps we can flow a beam through a bend or some kind of arbitrary path. And so that's exactly what we did. So we made this lattice that worked at 15 gigahertz. It was manufactured by 3D printing, fused deposition modeling at University of Texas, El Paso. And we put an antenna on one side. On the receiving side, in fact, we didn't use a horn antenna. We had a little probe antenna that we scanned around the outside of this lattice and plotted the data. So these red lines are our measured results. And it turns out the beam very effectively turned the bend. At the time, we didn't know if we would lose energy around the outside of the bend, but it worked very well. And as far as we could tell through simulation and experiments, we didn't lose any power due to the bend. Now, one thing that we could have done better, we didn't do anything at the edge of the lattice to prevent reflections. So as the beam came around the bend and it reflected, some of the energy went this way, some of the energy went back, and it basically scattered. That's what led to the noise here. And the noise was very consistent with our simulations. So had we done something at the edge of the lattice to prevent reflections, uh, we think this would be an extremely efficient way to, to turn a beam around a bend. Now this was at 15 gigahertz. The lattice is very large. Uh, we don't really, we never really thought this would be practical for microwave frequencies, but we did think it was practical at optical frequencies. So we teamed with the University of Central Florida and we made this lattice at the optical scale and we, we turned the same bend with an optical beam at just under three micron wavelength. And after scouring the literature, it turns out we've achieved the world's tightest bend of an unguided optical beam. Uh, and in fact, we not only got that record by far, we did it with a very low refractive index. This is just SU8, which is a, a UV curable epoxy, has a refractive index between 1.5 and 1.6. Other folks that are trying to do bends like this uh, require much larger bends so that they don't lose the light. And they're using much more, not necessarily exotic materials, but have a, a higher refractive index, more like 3.5 in order to get the bends that they're getting. So the ability to spatially vary a periodic structure has given us amazing performance here. Another thing we tried and this is just some preliminary results. We took a photonic crystal waveguide based on band gaps and we spatially varied the lattice outside of a multi-moded waveguide. And what it looks like this is doing is getting the, the individual modes through this very tight bend without scrambling the energy between the modes. So if we look on the far left here, we see a first order mode going in and a first order mode coming out. 
In the middle, we see a second order mode coming in and a second order mode coming out. If it scrambled energy in any way, it would look different. So we have yet to go in here and be real rigorous about calculating the, the scrambling of the energy, but visually we can tell that the scrambling is, is basically minimized. So this is pretty exciting as well. Where do we think all this is going? We would like to apply this to board level optical interconnects. The metal traces on boards are limited in bandwidth and if we could connect our packages with optical waveguides, we could let our systems run much faster. But there's some problems. The, we really can't take an optical waveguide and do a tight bend without losing light. And what happens when we have to cross waveguides? And we think these spatially variant lattices can play a role there. So that's what we're looking at right now. On a completely different topic, back to microwave frequencies, we wanted to address the problem if we have two or more electrical components in close proximity and their, their near fields overlap, they're coupled and they interfere. Is there anything we can do about that? And what we found is that if we embed a device in a material that is anisotropic, that we can reshape or sculpt the near field around it. And so the first thing we did is shown on this slide where we isolated a microstrip transmission line from a metal ball by sculpting the near field around the line. So this little orange strip that I'm running the, the cursor down, that's the microstrip. And the, the red thing around it is my visualization of the near field. And so we put a metal ball up next to the line before the SVAM was in place. So we just have the, the microstrip and a metal ball. And we hooked the microstrip up to our vector network analyzer which essentially pumps a signal through the line and looks at what gets transmitted and reflected. So we put the metal ball up against the line and pulled it away, put it back, pulled it away, and we saw the scattering parameters jump around. The blue line over here shows the delta S11. So the change in reflection as I'm taking this ball and moving it close to the line and away, close to the line and away. So it gives you an idea of how much this is jumping at some frequencies over 6 dB. The next thing we did was add our spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial and we tilted the orientation of the anisotropy. So at the edges, the holes are running vertical and as we work towards the ball, the holes lean over and it turns out that sort of pulls the near field away and then we stand the holes back up again. It stands the near field straight up. Now when we drop the metal ball down, we really didn't even measure any changes in the S11. And that's because we pulled the near field away. The, the line did not feel the presence of the ball because it had pulled the near field away from where the ball would be. And the red line in this diagram shows the Delta S11 for the case with the SVAM in place. SVAM being an acronym for spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial. The next thing we did with this is perhaps even more exciting. We printed a mock-up mobile phone and we, moved, we printed two identical antennas, folded dipole antennas, and you can see these two antennas here and here. They're too close, they don't work. And if we were to look at the S11 or the reflection from one of the antennas, this is what it looks like. So this is reflection from one of the antennas when both antennas are in place. And what we see is a relatively weak dip. It's a, it's a double dip. And it's a double dip because those antennas are coupled. They're acting much more like one large metallic structure than two separate ones. So to quantify the coupling between the antennas, we use something called the envelope correlation coefficient. And what this does is it's a mathematical operation. It looks at the, the far fields and does some kind of correlation to figure out how similar those are and how tightly coupled the antennas would be as a result. And it's a number that goes from zero to one. A value of one means your structures are short circuited and a value of zero means they're completely decoupled. They don't see each other. They're essentially on separate planets. They're not perturbing each other's near fields or anything like that. So a value of above around 0.5 is considered dysfunctional. Typically in cell phones, we have values in the order of 0.3. So the, the antennas inside a mobile phone are 
quite bad because they're so close to each other. They're close to other metal objects. And to date, there really hasn't been anything anybody could do about that. So then what we did is we, we put our spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial in here to attempt to decouple the antennas. And the bottom graph shows our new measurement. We see a nice deep single dip in S11, meaning we're really only seeing one resonance now. We, we think we have effectively decoupled the two antennas and our envelope correlation coefficient dropped down to about 0.018. Um, those numbers are experimental numbers. When we simulated it, we got similar curves. The envelope correlation coefficient simulated started around 0.7 and the ECC dropped to about 0.01. Uh, and we even have some later designs. We think we can get better performance than this out of it. But this is very exciting. And it's another example of how the ability to spatially vary a periodic structure allows us to unlock amazing properties. One of the newest things that we're doing, uh, we would like to put periodic structures onto curved surfaces. This is maybe a frequency selected surface on a ray dome. This is maybe a meta surface. However, how do we do this and yet keep the lattice spacing constant and the elements not deforming the shape of the elements? How do we do that? And it turns out we can use our spatially variant tool to do that. So even if we don't want to spatially vary our lattice, in order to put it on a curve, we have to spatially vary it. And so we adapt our algorithm and we can do just that. Another pretty neat thing, and also a source of confusion, well, what's the difference between what we're doing and this other thing called transformation optics? So let me step through this process that'll do a few things. It'll describe what transformation optics is and the role that this spatially variant tool can play here. So the process starts off by defining some kind of coordinate transform. and this is just a map, if you will, of how we want to bend the fields or the waves. So that's step one. In step two, we apply the coordinate transform to Maxwell's equations. So the coordinate transform enters in through the spatial coordinates, which is these del operators. And because Maxwell's equations are form invariant, we can pull the math out of the del operator and move it wherever we want to. So we choose to associate it with our constitutive parameters, the permeability and the permittivity. So we're back to our ordinary coordinates again, but now we have this crazy map of permeability and permittivity. And that's what we're showing at the bottom center here. We have some oddly shaped device and this crazy map of the permeability and permittivity that we need to bend the fields and waves the way we described in step one. So step two, this step is transformation optics. And it's a very hot area in electromagnetics right now. Unfortunately, most of the papers in transformation optics stop here. They'll take this crazy map of materials, throw it into a simulation and show that it does something wonderful. But we can't take this to a machine shop and tell them to build it. Clearly, there's more steps that, that need to happen. So we defined a third step. And somehow we have this library of engineered materials, whether they're photonic crystals or metamaterials or metasurfaces or whatever it takes. We have this library of engineered materials. And from this library, we can look at our crazy map of mu and epsilon. And we might say, OK, this point right here in our lattice might need to look like this. And over here, the metamaterial might need to look like that. And by the way, they may need to be in different orientations and different sizes. And we do all this and we map a meta material or engineer material to each point in our crazy map of mu and epsilon. And now somehow we have to bring all this together to generate a single overall lattice that is smooth, continuous, and defect free. That is tough. And that's the last step. So when we do that, it might look like this. This step four is the spatially variant algorithm. How do we spatially vary the geometry of the lattice, the orientation, the size of the unit cells, the fill fraction within the unit cells, material composition, 
maybe even the symmetry of the lattice itself. How do we spatially vary all that in a way that still leads to a lattice that is smooth, continuous, defect-free, and minimizes all the deformations that we do not want? So that's the role of the spatially variant algorithm.